Cool. That's just Mark. Hey guys. Okay, guys, so first up we've got um, Chris Berry from OR Information Security. He's going to be talking to us about offensive defense. So oh, good morning. Chris. Hi. Uh, my name's Chris. Uh, good morning. They say when you're doing a, a talk, imagine the crowd naked. So uh, I kind of feel pervy. But um, yeah, I am a uh, consultant at OR Information Security. Uh, we do a range of pen tests. Uh, which I'm sure everyone knows about by now, so I won't get into it too much. I've been with Aura for uh, about three years, and I'm the, also the resident weirdo, so bear with me if I throw some weird humor in, in this. Um, so what is this talk all about, really? Uh, it's really about known vulns which are regularly detected on uh, internal networks. Uh, internal networks, it's not really a topic when you're dealing with web applications, I'm sure you you can put that together. That's really for external pen tests. But at the end of the day, when you think about your web applications and you think about the people that are building them, administrating or administering those systems, um, they're doing it from the internal network. So there stands a chance that from the internal environment, your web servers, your web applications, even your cloud-based infrastructure could be vulnerable to some of these really old vulnerabilities. Um, if you think along the lines of Azure, you can have Azure Express Routes, which essentially puts your internal network um, directly connected to this segment in the cloud. So any of these vulnerabilities I'll discuss today uh, stands a chance that you could be vulnerable to them. In fact, these issues that I'm going to talk about, some of them are 20 years old. And it's kind of frustrating as a consultant when you know, you're on this kind of sincere mission to make the world or uh, the internet a safer place. I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's frustrating when you've done this for a while and you see the same issues affecting the same organizations and the same companies time and time again. And what that really hits home to me is that we need some mass awareness of these issues. Even though they're old and even though they're well publish 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 publicated, published, um, it stands, from my opinion at least, that no one's doing anything about them. And until we do get some mass awareness around these issues, even being old ones, nothing's going to change. So we need mass awareness in order to drive mass remediation. And remediation is, is the act of correcting this vulnerability. Either it's installing a patch or it's changing the configuration. So this talk... Uh, is really about getting 30 minutes of your mind to try and run through these issues, even if it's a refresher for you, tell you where there's value of these issues to an internal attacker, and give the blue team guys, the guys building the infrastructure, managing these systems, just a bit of a head start in how to fix the, the problems, how to look for them themselves using the same tools that I would use on an internal, um, and to show you what the value of these specific information you can get from these exploits will actually help you as an attacker. Internals, for me, it, it's my jam. Like, you know, some guys, I'm sure there's a lot of web app testers in the room, a lot of external, perhaps network testers, but I love internals. You know, um, internals give you that full attack surface that you get to explore. You get to see different types of systems, different functions, different setups, um, and quite a variety of different applications that guys have put into their networks with an attempt to make them more secure. But at the end of the day, um, it's a lot more interesting than, sorry to say that, actually, uh, looking at just the OWASP top 10. In fact, uh, from an internal perspective, if you think of your own network for a second, there's web applications that you're using inside your environment that perhaps you haven't published to the outside world, and you haven't gone through the, the OWASP checks potentially. And if your Wi-Fi, as an example, isn't configured correctly and anybody can just jump onto your Wi-Fi, these web applications uh, could lead to compromise of the system, and that could lead to lateral movement throughout. So what is an internal pen test, for those that don't know? Uh, it's conducted from the perspective of an unauthenticated internal attacker um, that has physical access to your network. It could also be that it's an external attacker that has breached one of your systems or bypassed some of your security and uh, achieved a level of foothold even to an external 
uh, exposed system. When we perform an uh, internal pen test, my strategy or, or my day-to-day kind of goes like this. Um, and it's about a week-long exercise for most environments. You arrive on, on day one, you get a desk, and you get a network cable. And that's it. And you click in, and the goal is really to go from no authentication to try and take over that network. And ultimately what that means to an attacker, an unofficial goal, is to become domain administrator. Now, domain admins, uh, for those that aren't too familiar with it, that's kind of the keys to the kingdom. When you achieve that level of access, uh, you can basically do anything you want on the, on the network uh, to your heart's content. You can add new users, you can modify systems, you can take files. It's also an exercise between blue team and red team. Now, blue team is naturally the defenders, which is the guys that have built the systems, the guys that have put in all the logging, um, systems, the auditing, the, they review the logs, and then you get your offensive side, which is the red team, which is your penetration tester. So the strategy, when I started doing this around 2005, was, looked a little bit like this. You grab a desk, you click into the network, and your number one uh, kind of task is to try and identify as much about that internal network as possible. We, you really want to identify some key critical systems domain controllers, lists of users, for example, systems that provide security controls, low-hanging fruit. You also want to get as much about the, the user base as possible. At the end of the day, if we want to become a domain administrator, there's a few ways to get to that, that end goal. One of them is to impersonate another domain administrator, which these vulnerabilities that I'll talk about, um, that's really what they achieve. And consistently using this approach for the past 10, 13 years, it's constant, like it's every single network. Every network I've tested in New Zealand, every network in Africa, every network in England, these issues affect you all. So I'm thinking, if I talk to you about it and any of you build systems, then if you apply these steps, we're doing mass penetration testing right now. I mean, we can fix say 100, 200 networks, make them more secure for free. Um, the tools, I'll talk about one or two tools, but this isn't a teach people how to hack uh, talk. I think that's a bit uh, uncalled for. The tools are all open source. Um, anybody can use them. They're really simple tools to use. And, and I'll introduce them so that you can grab a copy yourself or go and explore them and test them on your own network using the steps that we would and to identify if you're vulnerable. So the goal is grab a disk, find out as much about the network as you possibly can, find out about the users, and then the next goal is trying to establish a foothold onto the network, onto a system. Generally, this is a low-level user, but if you're having a good day, you're straight up domain admin. That's fantastic. Um, but if you're a low-level user or a local admin on one system, the goal then is to escalate your privilege and move laterally throughout the network to find more and more juicy stuff. That plan is still effective 10 years later. Um, you know, it just goes to show that even though the methodologies are quite static, the vulnerabilities are also static. No one's doing anything. So it's this kind of like frustration. Whoever builds systems in here, shame on you, I guess. So 13 years of doing this, approximately 90% of networks taken over. You know, that, I think that's lower than some organizations. Uh, uh, some crowds get up like 100% ownage, which is cool for them. Um, and it used to be like this, you know, as a, well, I wasn't a baby when I started. I, I'm small, but you know, I used to be a child with a handful of sand and, <laughs> and a pocket full of dreams. And lately it's become more like this. You know, you get that domain admin and you don't feel so good about yourself anymore because it's too easy, it's too simple. You want some challenge. Um, and the celebration's a bit, bleh, a bit flat. Party for one, please. So the realization came, all these networks have the same issues. Why? So I'm gonna introduce what I call the ridiculous six based on the, uh, the cheesy movie. Um, these are by no means the end of the attack kill chain in an internal pen test, but these are the ones that crop up. These are the ones that I use like every time. 
okay, like every time, and they're in no particular order. So the first one, woo, null sessions. Oh yeah. Uh, if you haven't heard about this, uh, <laughs> Windows 2000-esque is when they started cropping up. Effectively, what a null session is, is the ability to establish an anonymous connection to a system. And the purpose really would be to try and get a little bit of information from that system. The problem here is that domain controllers, if they accept null sessions, as an attacker, if I'm on step two of that, that strategy, you know, find out about the user base, enumerate those users, this is my go-to attack to do that. This is a 30-second attack, so it's step one of an internal pen test for me. Um, you basically run a tool, a command line tool, you run it against the domain controller, and if it's vulnerable, it dumps out, boom, the full Active Directory group structure, the user structure, and the group membership. Now, this is fantastic as, as guys on the, on the red team, oh, almost said blue team, shame on me, jeez, no offense. Um, but what this allows guys like me to do is basically create a list of members of domain admins, create a list of enterprise admins, and ultimately find out who I'm targeting in the next phases of the assessment. So you'll see in the, the next couple of vulnerabilities, they're quite passive, and really what you want to be able to do is target specific users. Now, obviously, if I want to be a domain admin, I'm going to target domain admins. You know, if I can be uh, Research2 or, or Charlie up there, then fantastic, I will be, have the ability to add myself to your domain and that's it, you know, it's game over. The ability to add myself to your domain and also be a domain admin with that hidden account. So for this um, attack, really what I use is a tool called enum for linux Now this is not an, a, a new tool, it's just a wrapper around some standard utilities. Um, and this tool is open source naturally. So there's a, a link there hidden by a minimalistic banner. We've got to do something with those. Uh, but Enum for Linux, yeah, this is my, one of my go-to happy tools. Um, never fails. Now, if it fails on a domain controller, that's not the end of the story. These null sessions are quite prevalent on different systems. So you can still point it at the full network if you so choose and try to derive as much information about that environment as possible. The next issue, I mean, this, I feel sad, actually, for talking about this. This is depressing. So I don't know if you guys are enjoying that, but um, servers, uh, server message block signing, so SMB signing. SMB is a protocol that's been with Windows since the dawn of time, slash Windows 2000. And um, really what it is, it's a protocol that's uh, widely used for file sharing and for printer sharing um, across a domain, an internal domain. The problem here is there's a feature for SMB called SMB signing. And it's disabled by default on all versions of Windows, which is fantastic. You know, it's not, nothing better than having great security, but it's not turned on out of the box. And then no one knows about it, so it never gets turned on. So it's not really security at all. It's pointless. But SMB signing, or the lack thereof, is fantastic to an attacker. Because the problem here for, for you is that with the lack of signing, an attacker can perform an attack known as SMB relay attacks. Now, SMB relay, in a simplistic term, is the ability to listen on the network for someone connecting to a network share, as an example, to capture that request, and to give it to a different system. And with the lack of SMB signing, that second system will quite easily accept the authentication request. Now, you don't need to know the password in order to establish that authentication. You just need to know the SMB hash. And with the SMB signing being disabled, this is all possible. So what that, looks like, what that looks like on a network is ultimately, it's, an, it's another one of those really quick, really easy attacks. You set up an SMB relay on your attacking system, and you just wait for these requests to traverse the network. And in an, a separate terminal, you set up your relay that's going to hand it off to your victim machine. And you can impersonate, and you can look out for different accounts. So in this instance here, if I know there's an administrator account, I basically set up the relay and I say, hey, if you see any requests for administrator flying across the network, 
try and give it to this different system. And if that user also has privileges on that second system, it will automatically give me a shell running on that box. And from there, you can do some quite nefarious things, like straight up just dump the creds off the box, the hashes off the memory, whatever, out the memory, whatever your heart chooses. It's as good as having a meterpreter shell sitting there. Um, you'll see here as well that uh, SMB signing needs to be false, and it's a Windows 7 box. The guidance for you here is how do you check for this? Well, the, the, there's quite a few tools. Um, I suggest Nmap. Uh, Nmap's not just a port scanner. Nmap has a full, full on scripting engine, and there's a whole bunch of default scripts that you can use to add to your Nmap checks. So there's a, uh, a variety of checks for SMB vulnerabilities. There's a variety of checks for other vulnerabilities, like missing patches, which you'll see later on. But it's a very quick check. So this is something that any administrator can quite easily run on their network across a full class B, should you so choose, against port 445, and you'll find out which systems are vulnerable by having uh, SMB message signing disabled. You'll see here, this is the check running. So I've just ran the script, and this would be the output here, where you'll see message signing is disabled, uh, dangerous but default, as we discussed. Um, and then you can go ahead and fix these boxes. Well, up until now, no one has, so I'm hoping you do from this point. The, um, this is my favorite vulnerability. This one is like super effective. Um, so it's link local multicast and NetBIOS name service broadcast resolution. Um, ultimately what this would be is two features of Windows that are designed to enable systems to find each other on a network, particularly when DNS fails. So you imagine a scenario where a user is searching for a network share, but they uh, accidentally put in the wrong name. They put in a typo. Now, behind the scenes, that system queries the DNS server. The DNS server says, hey, I don't know anything about this system. So the system tries to do other things. And it broadcasts along the network. It says, does anybody know who this machine is? And through this attack, you can intercept those broadcasts and trick the victim system into believing you are who they're looking for, so they try and authenticate to you. And in that instance, you grab a hash through that authentication attempt. Now, it's different to the SMB relay attack, where you can just give that hash to a different box. Okay? In this instance, when you get the hash, what you have to do is try and crack them. So you can use different tools, naturally, to try and crack passwords. Um, but what you don't want is an attacker to even get a sniff of these hashes, because ultimately what it means is they have this ability to go offline, perform some password cracking, and if you have a really crappy password policy, it won't take long before they derive that password. Stone security, you know, if you look online, there's a lot of write-ups on this, as you'd expect. But this is uh, the general concept of what I, I just mentioned there. So, you know, user types in the wrong name. Uh, DNS server says, I don't know. So the attacker here, running a simple tool, which we'll get into now, says, hey, that's me. And then the authentication tries to take place. This is the hash that you get as a result. Okay, so this is an NTLM v2 hash. So you can't pass this hash to a different box. You can't just hand it off and say, I am that guy. But what you get in that hash is a format where you get the username, who's trying to attempt, you get the domain name, and then you get a whole bunch of, uh, shall we say, not obfuscated, but definitely um, difficult to derive the password. And with that, in that context there, you can put this hash into Hashcat, and if the, weak, the password behind is quite weak, it shan't take long to actually reveal the actual password. So the tool of choice there is something called Responder. Now, I, I really love Responder, and I think there's an unsung hero in the pen test community, Laurent Gaffi. I don't know if I've pronounced, it, pronounced his or her name right, but it's French, so um, I threw in a faux French accent there. Now, Laurent Gaffi, um, he's one of my personal heroes just from, from what he does in the community. So um, he does have a Bitcoin wallet, 
and he's received the grand subtotal of donations of about $200. So while Bitcoin's going for a, for a, <laughs> a song at the moment, you may want to consider contributing to him. Uh, I don't know if that's against the rules, but yeah, do it. Uh, cool. You can also use Metasploit. Metasploit, as a framework, also has a, a couple of tools for net bias broadcast um, sniffing and for handing that off as well. So there's, you're not short of tools when it comes to this attack, but this attack has single-handedly resulted in myself getting domain admin time and time again. Um, when I go on site, while I'm doing that user enumeration, I have this tool running in the background just passively working away. It's non-disruptive on your network, so there shan't be any downtime. No systems, no user, users are impacted. But for an attacker, the value is immense. You know, if you can build up a collection of hashes, and if you're lucky enough that one of those belongs to a domain administrator, um, you're just one step away. You know, you just have to crack that hash. And when you're cracking the hash, you can try as many attempts as you want, naturally. It's not like you're trying to uh, defeat the domain password policy or that you get three attempts and I'm locking out your account. This goes completely unnoticed to attackers. I found recently, though, when I was running a responder on a network, one of my clients actually did pick up the requests flying across the network. So that was within some Microsoft security tool that they had just implemented. So I think there, there are some analytics or some logging utilities that are picking this up nowadays, so it's not as kind of um, under the radar as, as it used to be, but nevertheless, it's still not getting blocked. It's getting detected, but if no one's looking at the logs, it doesn't matter, really. You can just carry on. Um, password management, you know, leading on to, to the ability to capture the hashes, this is our second biggest issue that we detect in internals. Um, we have a tool that uh, one of my colleagues wrote that goes through all of our previous reports, passes through them, and identifies really what are all of our issues in the past um, collectively amount to. So how many times have we detected different issues? And this issue comes up as number two of all time. So, you know, despite all the awareness around password policies, despite all the security awareness that people purchase focused on password security, it's not changing. Nothing's changing. Um, and, and, you know, I blame the industry for this. I blame Google. Google, hands, hands down, is to blame um, in my books for enforcing crappy password policies because Google and all the others still hold us to that eight characters complex crap. Um, but what all that really does is force users to create passwords in patterns. Like, everyone has to use a capital letter in their password and everyone puts the capital at the beginning. So, I mean, what's the point, right? And everyone has to use a special character, but probably half the audience puts an exclamation at the end. So what's the point? You know, we, we can build that into your password cracking. You can apply these rules. So if you know people are gonna put a capital at the front, you take your nice, long, healthy word list and you just put in a rule that says, capitalize everything first. Capitalize that first letter and try that. And then if that fails, then lowercase everything and try that. And you can append all of these, um, or prepend special characters on the ends. And you can create these rules that make it very simple to go through the process of password cracking. So for me, the problem here is that the industry requirements are dumb. I've, I've said difficult, but I, I just think they're dumb. And I, I know that's um, a bit of a contentious issue because as security professionals, we've harped on about password security. But on my experience, there's a few fundamental problems here. You know, we, we're enforcing these bizarre password policies that force users to create patterns. And then because these patterns are so difficult to construct to satisfy these dumb policies, people are reusing those same passwords for different accounts. So if you think about your admins, you know, we see this time and time again. Your admin will have their standard user account, and then they'll have their domain admin super secret account, but it's the same password. So, again, you know, if I can catch the hash of some users, I can actually, or if I can get the password of some users, and I've also enumed all your domain admins, I can literally just try all of those known passwords against your domain admins. And if they reuse the passwords, fantastic. It's even simpler. 
if I capture the hash of a, a standard user and I catch the hash of a dom domain admin user and the hashes are the same, well, then I actually know that they're reusing the password. So, you know, I don't have to try and crack two hashes at that stage. So, I mean, the blue team guidance here really would be do some password audits on your environment. Um, you can quite simply extract that ntds.dit from your domain controller. You can extract the NT hashes from it. You can do some self-analysis here. You don't have to spend money with us or anyone else to get this done. Uh, extract the hashes. Just go through them and look for similar hashes. And then if you see similar hashes, you know there's password reuse. Throw those hashes through Hashcat. Just get one of the, like, you know, realhuman.txt or one of these massive word lists and run through these common passwords and try and figure out what kind of mentality your users have. Because you'll be surprised when we see like domain admins with Monday 01. Um, that's a pretty bad password, but it's what we see in the wild, or I, I call the wild. Maybe your networks are wild. They seem wild. They are wild. Uh, uh, this is our number one issue, out-of-date software. Man, this is boring as, but uh, again, if all of the other attacks fail, go to attack, out-of-date software. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to um, stick a vulnerability scanning tool onto a network and just uh, scan the full class C. And you will be surprised how bad this is and how prevalent it is to actually find, nope, oh, I'm under attack. <laughs> to actually find a system somewhere that you can just throw some exploit code at and your system on the box and then everything else is pretty much jam. You just go ahead, extract the hashes, extract the creds out of memory and move laterally through the network. Um, the problem seems to be that it takes between three months and infinity to patch your boxes. You know, I'm sure you, the, the most fresh or recent vulnerability that we've been exploiting is MS17010, Eternal Blue. Um, you know, this is the WannaCry ransomware root cause problem. But what we found, like last year when that came out and, and when exploit code came out, we were like, yes, this is sweet. Internal pen test just became super easy because we know patching windows are, are incredibly long, especially in production, and sometimes never in test. Um, so we find that this problem exists throughout. In fact, on a recent pen test, I found a Windows NT box. Now, I, I don't know kind of the year when, this, uh, when NT4 was released, but you can think about this for a second, what happened next. <laughs> Um, Windows NT box, there's no patches, there's no nothing, there's probably no hardening, and this is keys to the kingdom right there. So I Jackie Chan, and I was like, what the fuck? So, you know, I guess internally there's a conversation that happens between risk and sysadmins, and they're like, hey, have we installed the latest patches? And the admins will, they'll swear you're, you're safe, but <laughs> they don't know, man. No, 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 they don't know. The, if, if you're a, a CIO, not to drop the blue teams in the crap here, but you deserve it. Um, if you're getting a report that says none of your systems are missing patches, those reports are filtered. <laughs> those reports are not realistic or they're only against a subset of systems. It's not your full environment because this is an issue that's not only affecting servers and infrastructure, any one of your workstations this is a problem. So, you know, if your users are, are road warriors, salespeople, and they're often on like customers' Wi Fi networks or using um, free Wi Fi, for example, if they're missing the patches, those boxes are still vulnerable to compromise. If your users are dumb and they click the phishing link and um, they install some bad code, those boxes are still vulnerable. Even externally at that point, you can move and pivot throughout the network. So the blue team guidance here, again, Nmap. Man, there's some scripts in there to look for MS17010, um, 08067 configure, a whole bunch of, I'd say, the top 10 issues or top 10 vulnerabilities, I guess, um, that Nmap feels uh, are relevant. Again, open VAS. Um, I know it's frowned upon by a couple of the pen testers, but I've used open VAS quite a lot. Um, recently, it's become a bit more stable. It's kind of like the ugly stepchild of Nessus. It's a fork, it's a community edition of Nessus, but it's very much capable of doing similar checks as Nessus, and again, it's free. 
So, you know, it's not the panacea, but it will improve the situation, definitely. Oh, wrong direction. And, and this is what the end map, um, or sorry, the, even Metasploit, for example, can check for missing patches. So when we're, I'm on an assessment, I'm bouncing around the network, I want to check who's vulnerable to what, you can use Metasploit, Nmap, OpenVAS. The last one is privileged service accounts. Now, service accounts, for those that don't know, are application accounts that your domain admins or your admins will create, and they'll use it to roll out software through all the workstations. It's pretty easy to create a service account for backups, for mail uh, administration, etc. The problem really is, is that people don't understand the level of permissions that these accounts need to have. So they end up giving it excessive permissions. Like time and time again, these accounts are members of domain admin um, user groups. And that ultimately means that these accounts that kind of get bypassed with your security controls are a way into the environment. So service accounts, for example, by their nature, they're excluded, or some people exclude them from multi-factor authentication, um, from password expiration, etc. And you'll see that these service accounts uh, are stored in files. So like McAfee has a problem where it's stored there. You think it's encrypted, but actually not. You can decrypt it really quick. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, there's no excuse to be vulnerable to 20-year-old Vons, really. It's, it's quite sad. So hopefully you can use some of this information. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, I'll drop this off here.